Welcome back, everybody, and I hope you did have the opportunity to boil the kettle and enjoy a cup of tea. So I am now very happy to welcome Anya Flynn uh, to start our next session. Anya was appointed as Director of the Decision Support Service in October 2017. And since then, she has been working to put in place the infrastructure and the awareness building required for the successful operationalization of the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act. And she's going to tell us some more about that today. So Anya, the screen is yours. Thanks very much, Aideen, and thanks very much to the NDA for the invitation to address this um, prestigious conference. Delighted to be here. So I will now um, make my way through a presentation um, in which I am going to look at the particular functions of the Decision Support Service under the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act and aligning those to the requirements um, under Article 12. So. in the hopes that you're all seeing that. So I think it's instructive just to look a little bit briefly at the history um, of the Decision Support Service um, and how it came to be under the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. As many of you will know, and some of you were involved in um, the very long journey of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act before it was eventually signed into law at the end of 2015. Um, in an earlier version, it was the Mental Capacity and Guardianship Bill of 2008, uh, and it established the Office of Public Guardian with certain quite limited supervisory functions. Uh, and throughout the parliamentary process and the debates uh, which took place uh, and some very influential um, contributors to that, those debates were able to say that that was uh, that, that title, um, both the title of the Act and the Office of Public Guardian had paternalistic connotations and that these were inconsistent with the primary purpose of the legislation to support decision making. So the name then, as we all know, of the Act was changed uh, to the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. Um, I often say that the brackets around capacity are significant because the primary focus of the Act is about supporting people to be their own decision maker. And the Office of Public Guardian designate, designation then evolved into the Decision Support Service. Uh, in a later draft, and there were several, um, the Decision Support Service was moved from the Court Service, which is where it was going to be located, to the Mental Health Commission. That really happened at the 11th hour in the middle of December 2015. Um, and in the comments at the time, the responsible um, senator said that this was to set a boundary between um, wardship and the, the new framework to really um, mark a departure from an intensively courts-based approach. So the part nine of the 2015 Act now sets out the uh, Office of the Decision Support Service and its statutory functions. So as I've mentioned, um, I set out the functions here on the right, and um, I have endeavoured to align them to the particular requirements under Article 12. So as we know, under Article 12.3, there is an obligation on state parties to take appropriate measures to provide access uh, to persons with disabilities to the support that they may require in exercising their legal capacity. And then the um, functions of the DSS, which I think uh, attempt to deliver on that obligation are these, so that the director has an obligation to promote awareness of the 2015 Act and of the UN Convention, to promote public confidence in the new framework for support, to provide information to the relevant person and to the new categories of supporters, uh, and relevant person as defined by the Act means that person whose capacity, meaning decision-making capacity, um, whose decision-making capacity is or may be called into question. And supporters refers to um, any one of five different categories of supporter under the Act across the various tiers uh, and considering also the tools for advanced planning. So we have these information and guidance providing functions uh, to provide information also to various organisations and bodies, really to ensure that this Act is, is understood 
um, and that it isn't disapplied, if you like, in any setting, and that access to the supports of this act must become a feature of care and of service delivery. And we can only try to achieve that by building awareness. And we have a function also to make recommendations for changes in practice that may prevent a person from exercising their capacity. And in the course of that awareness raising and information and guidance provision function, we have um, developed certain key messages um, and these are, are somewhat um, disparate, but uh, I think these are the, the principal ones that we have found ourselves you know, delivering to, to stakeholders. So that, as I say, access to the supports under the 2015 Act must be available in all settings. The primary focus of the Act is to support people to make their own decisions. It isn't primarily about assessing capacity or new tools for accessing consent. And we see that in the guiding principles so that you don't conclude that somebody lacks their decision making capacity unless and until you've done everything to support them in their own decision making. The Act emphasises also the importance of a participatory model of decision making. It says also that tools for communication must be made available. You can't decide that somebody doesn't have capacity unless you have made available to them the tools which they require in their particular circumstances, should that be assistive technology sign language or whatever it might be. We've also found ourselves required to address a really pervasive misapprehension about the current role of the next of kin. Um, there is an idea, and it's, it's misplaced, that an adult gets to decide for another adult by virtue of the proximity of a family relationship. And that isn't and hasn't been true outside of a properly a proper legal arrangement. It isn't true that you get to decide for your loved one should they lack their decision making capacity and instead we find ourselves promoting the idea that with this act there is an opportunity perhaps to be that decision supporter to step into a formal and recognized role which is what i mean by the next point that the act provides opportunities to replace uncertainty with secure arrangements a key theme obviously is the move away uh, from best interests to a rights-based model with will and preferences at its heart. And we often find ourselves addressing what are sometimes perceived as challenges in the, the guiding principles. Um, particularly um, challenging is the idea of, of will and preference very often, um, and also what is sometimes shortened to the right to be unwise. The Act doesn't enshrine a right to be unwise. What the Act says is that the fact that you want to do something that seems unwise doesn't mean that you lack the capacity to decide to do it. And that can seem challenging to people and um, we need to ensure that people uh, see how that sits alongside safeguarding concerns. Thinking then about Article 12 and, and safeguarding, so that uh, Article 12, as we know, sets out that the state is obliged to provide measures to ensure um, against abuse uh, and respect for rights, will and preferences, um, to ensure that measures are free from, the con from conflict of interest and undue influence and that measures are always limited in time and scope and proportionate and subject to ongoing review. So how do the functions of the DSS align to those obligations? We have specific responsibility to register decision support arrangements, and this will include also the management of objections. So um, it, it varies across the different tiers of support, but when you're registering uh, an arrangement, uh, a co-decision making arrangement, shall we say, with us, uh, there are, you must notify certain parties so that they have an opportunity to say, well, um, let's, let's be careful here that the person who is being appointed as a decision supporter, a co-decision maker is perhaps not best placed uh, to take on that role. So we'll be managing those objections, maintaining searchable registers, uh, and that's for the protection of, of the relevant person so that if they've made an arrangement, they are uh, accessible, that people know that they have to um, honour and, and respect that arrangement. Uh, and it also provides certainty about what is inside scope and outside of scope. So we would be supervising compliance by supporters, including the review of periodic reports. Should the need arise, there is an opportunity to escalate issues of non-compliance to court. Um, we have a complaints and investigations function, which I say more about in a moment. 
and we'll be publishing codes of practice for the better guidance of decision supporters and professionals. And there will also be an overarching code on supporting decision making and assessing capacity. I've put supporting decision making in uh, italics there because that's not actually in the text of the Act as you read it at the moment. But it is very important that guidance is available on people, supporting people to be their own decision maker. And we also have a particular function in relation to the Hague Convention on the International Protection of Adults. I've mentioned that we have a complaints investigations function, so we have an opportunity to hear complaints, um, complaints relating to these matters um, where a supporter is acting outside of scope, uh, if they are unsuitable for various reasons as defined, uh, which could include um, having certain criminal convictions. Um, if the arrangement is that is proposed is not in accordance with will and preferences, any instance of fraud, coercion and undue influence can be a ground of complaint. There could be complaints relating to capacity issues. The argument could be that the person has perfect decision making capacity uh, to take decisions entirely independently. Uh, and then there's a broad catch all provision so that we can investigate any breach of function or a breach of provision of the act or of the guiding principles. So we could receive a complaint that somebody isn't respecting will and preferences. Um, I've set out our particular powers then on the right so that we can um, commission a special or general visitor to take up evidence to assist us in that investigation, summons witnesses, um, there is a route to court um, should a complaint be found well founded and subject to an amendment to the Act. And Minister Gorman mentioned this morning that the Act is to undergo some amendment. We are hoping to secure to ourselves a power to temporarily suspend a decision supporter from acting while an investigation is pending. The Act creates criminal offences also of fraud, coercion, undue influence, uh, abuse or neglect. So where there is evidence of, of these, then we would find ourselves uh, escalating to the civil authorities. We can conduct own initiative investigations and resolve informally, which I think could be important. Um, Article 12.5 then uh, requires state parties to um, support and vindicate property rights for people, uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, and again, the DSS has a number of functions which align to this commitment so that we will be supervising arrangements which will include property and affairs decision. We will be monitoring those guiding principles um, and to ensure that decision supporters are respecting them. And one of those uh, guiding principles is the right to control over one's own finances and property. We will have a panel of decision making representatives. So that's at the top tier court authorised um, level of support. Um, so that if there isn't anybody available, suitable or willing in a person's life, who can step into that decision-making representative role, we will have panels um, of experts available who can be appointed by the court. But there will be a preference for family members. The court is obliged to look at existing family relationships and the desirability of preserving those relationships. Um, we have had, as part of our stakeholder engagement, um, a lot of contact with the banking and financial services sector to try and look at how current practices align or don't align with the Act and with the Convention. And finally, we are, will be promoting advanced planning by way of enduring power of attorney, something that everybody should consider. If I can just briefly say what we don't do, um, and we find it important sometimes to call this out. So the DSS doesn't have within its remit the responsibility to make decisions for people in some other jurisdictions, um, the Office of Public Guardian or Public Guardian and Trustee is the decision maker of last resort, but it's not the case for us in the Decision Support Service. We won't directly appoint decision supporters. We don't have a function to manage people's money and property. There is a small subsection which says that we could as a last resort, but we don't expect that to be um, part of the commenced legislation. And we can only regulate and supervise arrangements within the Act that are notified to us, registered with us. Um, and we're not the regulator of other professionals, so we will um, not be able to sanction other professionals. But if it's brought to our attention that, you know, a medical, healthcare professional, legal, financial services uh, provider isn't uh, perhaps understanding or respecting a particular arrangement under the Act, then I think we can intervene, but not directly act to, to sanction. Um, those bodies obviously have their own regulation. 
Um, and just to say then, finally, where we are um, with our own vision for the DSS. So we see ourselves very much as being an independent service underpinned by the guiding principles. So the director is at all times bound by those section eight guiding principles. We want to be a progressive, outward facing and accessible service. We're well aware of the obligations to engage with the people who are going to be using our service um, to ensure that um, the model is fit for purpose and meets their needs. And to that end, we have engaged in focus group work around our process and system design. We want to be a person-centered and rights-based model we see ourselves very much as supporting the supporter also, um, not fundamentally policing or regulating these support arrangements, but ensuring that the supporter is supported so that everything is working well. And I think we need to um, monitor ourselves. So we'll be setting strategic objectives. We need to know what good looks like. Um, and with that in mind, we'll be keeping the whole framework and our own operations under review. We have a statutory duty to report and to recommend ongoing change. And I think in so doing, we will be assisted very much um, by the, the feedback um, of our key stakeholders, and we will be encouraging that um, on an ongoing basis. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I have provided here um, our website address uh, with a statutory function to set up a website. So that's been up and running for over a year. And we already have um, a query uh, function and, and we welcome questions uh, and attempt, attempt to answer those on the website where you'll also find frequently asked questions, further information about the Act and some suggestions on what you can be doing to prepare for it. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be seeing more of you later, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, and it is clear that a lot of work has been carried out so far to prepare for the commencement of the legislation next year. I do already see some questions in, uh, coming in for Anya, um, and what is going to happen now is that uh, I'm going to hand over to Patricia Rickard clark to chair the next se session, where we will hear about um, how different sectors and stakeholders will be impacted by the legislation on its commencement. And um, after that session, there will be a question and answer session moderated by Patricia and questions for Anya will be included in that. So as Anya says, you will see her later. And just a reminder, given the, the rich information that we've been hearing this morning, that this conference is being recorded and will be up on our website in the coming weeks. So I will let Patricia uh, introduce the speakers on her panel, but I would like to thank Alice, Bernice, Quiva, Gary, Louise and Patricia for their time and input this morning. So over to you, Patricia. Thank you, Aideen, and thank you to the NDA for inviting me to participate in this extremely important uh, conference. So I'm going to first briefly introduce members of the panel, um, and they are Alice White, who uh, is Registrar Wards of Court, and Alice was appointed Registrar in 2019. And she has worked prior to that in, of course, uh, a number of the offices in the court service. Next, we have Patricia Hickey, who is the general solicitor for minors in wards of court. And Patricia was appointed to that role in 2015. And again, prior to that, has spent many years in the general solicitor's office. Uh, next, we have uh, Bernice Eboy, who is head of legal and regulatory in the Banking and Payments Federation of Ireland. And uh, Bernice took up the role in uh, BPFI in 2014. Prior to that, she worked in a legal department of a bank. And prior to that, she spent many years in private practice. Then we have Quivet Leeson, who's the National Programme Manager for the HSE Office for Human Rights and Equality. Uh, Quiva is the HSE representative on the Interdepartmental Steering Board for the commencement of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. And she also has obviously had a huge oversight role in drafting many of the codes of practice uh, for the Act, particularly uh, for the healthcare sector. Then we have Louise Lachlan, who is the National Manager of the National Advoc Advocacy, Advocacy Service. And Louise also oversees uh, the development and delivery of the patient advocacy service. Uh, Lu Louise was appointed to this role in 2016 and again worked with the National Advocacy Service for a number of years uh, before that. 
And finally, but certainly not least, uh, we have Gary Lee, who's solicitor for, in the Ballymun Community Law Centre. He's the managing solicitor in the Community Law Centre. And as we all know, those community law centres play, play a very vital role, particularly uh, assisting people, supporting people in various different challenging circumstances. Uh, Gary is also the vice chair of the Human Rights Committee of uh, Human Rights and e Equality Committee of the Law Society, and he's a member of the council. So th there are the panel, and uh, what, just the format that we're going to follow is, I have a number of questions that I'm going to put to each member of the panel in turn. And I'm going to be very uh, strict on time because we have uh, a large panel at the same time, we want to hear the various different views from the different stakeholders. So um, the first question is, uh, and um, I'm going to take it in the turn that I've read out the uh, bio notes, first of all. So how will the introduction of the legislation impact the way in which your sector currently uh, works? So Alice, over to you first. Thank you. Okay, well, as the Registrar of Wards, of course, this long awaited legislation will commence the wind down of wardship, the wardship system in Ireland. And while I won't quite be out of the job, it will see major changes and a reduction in work and responsibilities coming into the wards of court office. The office will continue to register enduring powers of attorney created under the 1996 Enduring Powers of Attorney Act and will still have responsibility for minor wards of court and other areas assigned under the rules of the superior courts. We are all aware of the restrictions imposed on a person by substituted decision making. These are wide ranging and vary from small decisions to life changing decisions, such as around where a person can live. The office is currently restricted to working within the parameters of the Act of 1871. And I and the staff in the Wards of Court Office welcome the commencement of this legislation and the autonomy, self-control and support it will confer on people who were former wards of court. The legislation also provides for the repeal of the Marriage of Lunatics Act, which has already been repealed earlier this year. And while we've received a couple of inquiries into the office in relation to marriage, to my knowledge, no ward of court has yet married since that repeal. Within the wider court system, the biggest impact will be seen within the circuit court. And Will have, which will have exclusive jurisdiction for applications under the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act, with the exception of applications for withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment or live organ donation. The transfer of jurisdiction from the High Court to the Circuit Court should improve accessibility to the court system for those who require it and reduce the costs of bringing an application to court. While it's unlikely there will be an office in each county where an application can be made under the Act, there will be an office in at least each circuit in addition to Dublin. And it is planned that a lot of the applications could be made remotely with options to bring an in-person application. The provision of legislation in the, the provision in the legislation for the appointment of a court friend to assist a person going to court goes further than what is currently allowed for and will provide a welcome addition in the courtroom, providing assistance and explanations when they are required and also assisting in putting a person's views and wishes to the court. Okay, However, okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thanks. Move on then to uh, Patricia. Patricia, the same question. How is your sector preparing for the introduction of the legislation? You'd be glad to hear, Patricia, mine will be quite short because um, Alice has covered out the actual wardship. And I think it's an important opportunity now to explain that there is a difference between the Office of the Wards of Court and the General Solicitor's Office. The General Solicitor's Appointments Committee, I am the same as every other committee in the country. There's no special treatment. I have to go to court. I have to put proposals to the court, as does anyone else. So I think that's important to, to make that difference clear for going forward for everybody. So the impact on my office is actually quite personal because there's only one general solicitor and I've over a thousand cases. But of those, over 700 are active cases. 
So in those 700 active cases, my office will have to review every case and that is going to be a massive impact and, and we can deal with that later on with the challenges. Um, the office will still continue. The general sister will still be there for minors. So the office will continue. But for the three years for the wind down, um, there'll be a substantial impact on my office. And there's not much more I need to say um, in relation to that, well, question, Patricia. Thank you. And I'm sure you'll have plenty to say on other points as well. So uh, next then, uh, Quiva, uh, the same question to you, the impact uh, on your uh, services. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Um, uh, I suppose our service has the, the relevance of the Act is enormous for the health service, the HSE in particular. Um, and I suppose just to try and maybe kind of pin it down to a number of three key areas. Um, the first one will be next of kin decision making, which Anya already spoke about. That's a prevailing practice. Um, uh, the consent to vaccination program really highlighted that it is it is a challenge for people to um, understand that they don't have the legal right to consent for another person or to make decisions on behalf of another person. So I think that is going to be our single biggest challenge to be able to bring people with us and also to explain that um, that, that has never been the case, that the Act isn't changing um, that particular issue. Um, the second one then uh, will be the whole concept of will and preference. Um, and I think that there, that, that that will also be a challenge in terms of um, if we think about um, a person's choice and where they want to live and a person's will and preference in the main is generally to live at home. The absence of a statutory home care scheme or, or other supports to enable that is going to be incredibly challenging. Um, and I think that's um, well recognised, certainly within health and social care. How, how do you honour a person's will and preference when the supports simply are not there? So I think that's that's something that we really, we really have to um, grapple with. And the third kind of really big issue is the presumption of capacity. Um, we know that that prevails in some parts of the health and social care services, but in others it doesn't. So there's quite a substantial piece of work to bring people along to be able to understand how that works and what that means and what that means for the person. Um, just a couple of others then, I'm just conscious of your time, of our time, um, uh, there, and, and we'll come to it in, in other questions, but the whole issue of management of risk and what does risk mean? How is risk assessed? How is risk determined? How does that then relate to an unwise decision? I think we have quite a bit of work to do to work out a, a new paradigm of assessing risk. And quite a bit of work has been done in England and Wales. I think it might be interesting to ask Alex about that this afternoon. But I think we've we've a good bit of work to, to rethink risk and what risk might mean. Um, I also think that, um, and Anya has talked about this a lot, not just today, but in other in other times, and, and um, uh, Alberto also referred to it that that this is this is a cultural shift that we're trying to do. So so we can't do this alone in the health services. So there needs to be campaigns about all of these issues to enable that to become normalised. Um, and I think you know there needs to be campaigns with the role of families and and supporters and what that might mean, and um, the role of risk. Um, you know what's positive risk? What does that mean? I think there's there's a good bit of work to be done across all of sectors, but particularly in the media to help this transition. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bernice. Uh, just again coming at it from a different perspective, if you again would comment on the question, how will the introduction of this legislation impact on the way in which your sector currently works? Uh, thank you, Patricia. I, my apologies about my video. I'm having some technical hitches here. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can indeed. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patricia, and thanks to the NDA. So in terms of the impact, um, well, first of all, let me say that uh, the sector is positive about the Act and its benefits for customers and for financial service providers uh, in supporting customers and in engaging with customers. Now, it requires a big change in the way cases are approached and the way in which customers are supported. And admittedly, it has been hugely challenging to learn about the functional approach to capacity. 
So financial service providers have learned to understand the functional approach to capacity and what that means when engaging with and supporting customers. And admittedly, there's more learning and more training and more education to go yet. Um, I think in terms of the impact then, we have to look at the way business is conducted. It's so much less likely that we will be in a branch or a hub nowadays, uh, engaging with our financial service provider. Our engagement is much more likely to be on a phone call or via a video link. Now, the people working with customers and supporting them need a lot of training and guidance. And this is the huge, uh, the important part of implementation programs. In practical terms, then, um, and Anya alluded to this, uh, current practices have to be reviewed to ensure that they align with the Act. So, for example, we need to recognise and record decision makers and then link up their supporters with those decision makers on the system. So there's what's called onboarding processes need to be looked at and um, brought up to speed in order to identify the supporters and to link the supporter to the relevant person's account, for example. I don't think I can emphasize uh, enough the uh, need for training and education. And I think that links into a change in overall culture. And um, this has to be an impact that culture and a change in culture comes about with education and engagement with all stakeholders. Uh, uh, I, I've seen it, and I think members will agree, uh, our members, that uh, there's a growing appreciation about the very negative impact of not having access to your money. There's the obvious things, you know, that you can't pay for your health care, um, for your uh, uh, medical costs, but it's hugely more impactful than that. You know, it deprives a person of so much more. Uh, and an inability to thrive. So I do believe that the, that appreciation is growing and that cultural shift is imperative. And finally linked to that, I think, is an interagency approach um, to that engagement, that all stakeholders are engaged and that we learn from each other, we learn from expertise uh, and know-how and that's interagency, and might I say interregulator in terms of uh, the financial services uh, sector also. Thank you very much. Bernice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to uh, re-emphasize the point you made about the functional approach with Alberto uh, mentioned this morning, a move from the medical model to a human rights model. And that's key to the whole act, really. It's all about human rights and respecting those rights. So I'm going to move on now to Louise. Louise, can you uh, again give us your thoughts and about the sector and the impact? Cheers. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah, thanks, everybody. From a national advocacy service, we've been preparing for the commencement of the legislation and the going live of the DSS for some time, the principles of the Act are embedded in our own code of practice and our own values as an organisation. So I think from the point of view of our own sector and our own preparation, um, we can say that we put a lot of um, work into that over the last number of years. I think in particular, um, in terms of our work um, that our advocates do on the ground, and I suppose we would touch off against all of the sectors who have spoken already, so both in terms of um, uh, uh, Patricia's work and Alice's work in the general solicitors and in the wards of court office, the HSC and um, actually finance is a massive issue. In all of those sectors, the advocate would work with the individual to support them to have their will and preference heard um, and also to work with other providers um, and other services to work from a presumption of capacity basis and as has, has been rightly said that is the position in Ireland the functional capacity assessment is the legal position but it's not always reflected in reality as, as the other uh, speakers have mentioned so I think that's very much about where we have um, positioned ourselves over the last number of years um, 
And I think that piece that uh, Anya mentioned in her presentation around the um, what we often refer to as the right to make an unwise decision that then that, that Anya correctly states that it's more about thinking of that as the, the, the right not to be assumed that you've lost capacity because you want to do something unwise would be something that very much would be aligned with our own work. I think the other piece is that um, in terms of our own preparation as an organisation through our code of practice, we also provide a lot of supervision and support to our staff because it can be very challenging to go into an organisation with that position of presumption of capacity and supporting will and preference. And so we do put a lot of energy and thought into how we can support our staff to sustain themselves and also to sustain the individuals they're working with. So that's really, I suppose, where we would come from in terms of the impact on my own organisation. So, and I think just really to echo what the other speakers have said about the different areas, but I know we're going to come on to the challenges, um, particularly around next of kin vaccines, those types of things, I think will be an interesting conversation this morning. Right. Thank you, Louise. So, uh, Gary, then over to you, uh, same question. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Patricia. I think it's important to say at the outset um, that although I'm on the Council of the Law Society, I'm not actually representing the Law Society here. So, so uh, the, the views are, are, are my own. Um, it, it was very interesting to hear actually what Alberto was saying earlier, uh, that lawyers were the hardest group to convince. Um, and he noted that objections centred around perceived attack on existing protection systems for adults. And, and he said that the failure to have meaningful consultation uh, made the process uh, very messy. I just thought that was, that was very interesting. Um, traditionally, though, I think it is, it is fair to say that lawyers have viewed disability as something that's intrinsic to the person rather than in the context of societal barriers to that person's participation in the community. So when we talk of decision-making assistance, we are saying that we will remove these barriers and enable people to decide. So some solicitors I think are very wary of the uh, Decision-Making Capacity Act, seeing it as, as threatening the solicitor-client relationship, whilst others are embracing it and, and, like me, know that it will actually enhance that relationship and bring a certain degree of clarity to where um, you know, perhaps there was previously confusion. Um, the solicitor-client relationship um, is and has always been a fiduciary one. So it's a special type of relationship at the heart of which lies trust, confidence and reliance. Um, solicitors are quite rightly very protective of that special relationship. And the solicitor has to act for the benefit of, of his or her client and on the instructions of that client. So we've always had to consider whether the client has capacity to give instructions and to make decisions. That's 30 years since I started working in practice. And over that uh, time, the profession has seen a change in the way we answer the question of capacity. When I started out the question, the answer was, I suppose, very much seen as a, as a medical uh, question. And it was very much a medical matter to be answered by medical practitioners, where, where there was a doubt you'd have a doctor or doctor certify that the person had capacity. And over the years, the decision of whether someone had or had not capacity shifted away from the doctor's decision to read that of one of the solicitor. So it became the solicitor who would determine capacity and perhaps rely upon a, a doctor's certificate as evidence in terms of justifying that determination. So with the Assist Decision-Making Capacity Act, we have a further evolution from the medical model. In, in, in a way, it's, I think it's a, it's a real pity that the, the, the word capacity, and um, Anya alluded to it earlier on, uh, has, has remained in the title to the act. And, and it's not just um, known just as the Assist Decision-Making Act. Um, but now the focus is, or rather should be, on decision-making and the process of this decision-making rather than being medically rooted in the issue of capacity. Um, and there is, in my view, a positive obligation on solicitors to support their clients to make their own decisions to the extent that they can. Although, having said that, uh, solicitors are not actually specified as, as interveners in the Act. Um, so having noted that, if a solicitor has a doubt about a client's capacity to make a decision, the solicitor will need to be aware of how to support the client to enable that decision making. And this is, I think, what um, the legal profession uh, is going to find particularly challenging. So in order to support the client, a solicitor may well have to um, engage with other professionals and have other professionals attend solicitor client meetings, for example. Um, but that person is there in his or her capacity as a facilitator. So really, there should be an understanding by both that person of the nature of the solicitor client relationship, but also by the solicitor of the necessity in some cases of having a personal assistant or an advocate or whoever uh, attend. And obviously, there'll be times also when co-decision makers and indeed decision making representatives may also have to uh, liaise with solicitors 
um, on behalf of or, or uh, in assistance of the client. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I cut off there. Yeah, thank you very much. So we move on then to the second question, uh, which is how is your sector preparing for the introduction of the legislation? And really we have a third question about the challenges, which I'm very anxious to get on to. So I'd ask you to be a little bit briefer in answering this question, uh, because obviously talking about the challenges will highlight uh, really uh, the preparation as well. So I'm going to go in a slightly different order. So Quiva, I'm going to ask you uh, first uh, to answer on this one. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Um, so we started as soon as the legislation um, was passed in 2015, we started a programme of work to um, be ready because we appreciated that this act has huge implications for all of our practitioners um, and needed um, a concerted effort to, to, to get things in place. So a number of things that we've done in those intervening years, um, uh, we placed a lot of, it, of focus on information. So we do um, uh, information sessions um, all over the country. And then with COVID, um, all of those moved online. Um, so we've engaged with probably about 25,000 people in the time since 2016. Um, uh, and we do it with, we do it across a number of sectors and we do it with people who are affected by the act, with families, with advocates, with organisations, with lobby organisations, advocacy organisations like the National Advocacy Service. So it's most effective when we do it in partnership with others. Um, uh, we've we've held four national conferences. Obviously, we, we've had difficulties with COVID and with the cyber attack. But we've continued to engage um, in respect of that. Um, this year, we have started with three e-learning modules that are in train at the moment, one on supporting decision making, one on advanced planning and one on the functional approach to capacity. Um, in January, once the, the um, draft heads of the bill is complete, we'll start to work on uh, the overview of the Act, um, more specifically on advanced healthcare directives, and then uh, a third, which we have yet to decide what that might be. So that's going to be ready um, for commencement. Um, uh, we also are working with a number of sites within the HSE on what does the Act mean for your service and what do we need to do about that? So with disability, mental health, um, a CHO in terms of a pilot um, and then we've been working with a number of specific services to think about what this might mean because it's, it means different things in different contexts because our services are very varied and disparate um, uh, and and just one final thing if I can say Patricia just um, before so we, we also have just we're just about to publish a book um, on personal and professional reflections on the act, um, which we will share. It's not, it hasn't been published yet, but we can share uh, the link with participants um, from this conference today. So thank you. Thank you very much. And obviously a lot of work um, done by the HSE uh, so far. So I'm going to move on to Louise. Um, again, the preparation uh, for the introduction of the legislation. Thanks, Patricia. I think, as uh, Quiva said there, that um, the work um, that has gone on by way of collaboration between the HSE and Quiva's office in particular, and my own organisation, has been really critical in our own development and hopefully in the state of readiness for the, the HSE as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have aligned our own practices to the principles of the Act a number of years ago, so our focus has been very much on embedding that down, ensuring that it's delivered um, on the ground with the person with the disability when they access our service, that that's the service that they receive, that they're supported um, to have a presumption of capacity applied by other people who are involved in their life, and in particular around professional decision makers and also family and friends as well. Um, I think the other piece that's really important is that we have also started our engagement with the Decision Support Service um, to start that conversation about what advocacy will look like under the Act and um, in the implementation of the DSS. Um, it's quite complex in a way because the Act itself doesn't really make any provision for advocacy. There's only one reference to advocacy in the Act, which is around a code of practice. Um, however, I think, as others have mentioned, the role of the advocate really is critical to the success of the Act. As Gary mentioned there, the engagement of um, an advocate when working with legal professionals can be really important to assist in the communication process. And likewise, with clinicians and other medical professionals, it can be really important. So I think from our point of view, um, there are going to be 
a significant role for our advocates in terms of the um, complaints mechanisms and also ensuring people have access to the provisions of the Act. Um, that would really be the main things that we are now considering and preparing for as to how we further develop our work in that regard. Thank you, Louise. Um, so I'm going to ask Gary now, um, preparedness, Gary, uh, for the introduction of the legislation. Yeah, um, well, I think the, the first obvious thing to note is that solicitors will be subject to the Act, but they're also a vital part of, of its operation. On the one hand, we'll have the interaction of solicitors um, with their clients who might be relevant persons. And then on the other hand, we have the role of solicitors in the fundamental operation of the Act. So it'll generate work for solicitors and solicitors will, will act for relevant persons and interveners. And it'll generate other work, I suppose, in terms of um, enduring powers of attorney and advanced healthcare directives, as there is an increasing awareness uh, of the importance of, of those instruments. Um, and of course, there'll be circuit court applications and to a much lesser extent, high court applications. Um, from early out, the Law Society established um, a mental health law and capacity task force, which um, Patricia formerly chaired. Um, various um, courses have been run through the law school and articles published in the Gazette and private training obviously is also available. And the Law Society has also made very significant submissions to government. Um, the Law Society should obviously issue a new practice directive in the area, which which um, hopefully will, will issue after the, the uh, Decision Support Service uh, Code of Conduct is published. Mm. Um, the Decision Support Service itself uh, obviously is a significant resource. Um, so, But I think the onus rise, lies primarily on the individual solicitor to ensure that he or she is familiar with the Act and, and is prepared for its commencement. And practising solicitors and barristers, you know, they'll of course be guided by the, the Code of Conduct for, for practice of, uh, for legal professionals. Um, which has been drafted by our host, the, 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 N, the NDA, um, together with the Decision Support Service. Um, but obviously, particular attention will have to be paid to the to the code, which will hopefully set out that the assisted decision making capacity, what it's about, um, why we need a code. The focus uh, should really be on facilitating decision making, um, and that access, assessing capacity should be the last resort. Um, so imagine. It'll set out how pro professionals should work with, with interveners. Um, but um, but I, I, I leave it there anyway, Patricia. Thank you, Gary. Alice, uh, over to you. The same question about preparedness. Yeah, and I, the Ward Support Office, we've been working with a number of offices within the court service, as well as part of the interdepartmental panel and working with the decision support service and preparations. Um, in preparing the office for the commencement of part six, which will involve the review of 2,100 wards of court, the listing of those reviews before the court and the eventual discharge then, the office has taken a number of steps, including the commencement of a communications program to committees and the recruitment of additional medical visitors onto our panel the um, received sanction for the recruitment of additional staff to the office. We've been working with members of the judiciary around the planning of the listing of the discharge applications and how that, how that will um, sit within the court because we're going to have a business as the usual court list for existing wards of court, for minors, for enduring powers of attorney alongside a separate court list for the discharge applications. Um, the office will see an initial increase in staff numbers. And then as wards of court are discharged from wardship, we will begin winding down our staff numbers. Um, the communications campaign that we've issued, we're doing that by email as well as by post two committees and the first communication contained a survey question just asking committees um, to discuss with wards around when they plan to make their initial make the discharge application and the results that came in from that were 42 percent of respondents said they intended to apply within year one 13 percent of respondents intend to apply within year two and 45% of respondents intend to apply within year three uh, for the discharge. The office is continuing, going to continue to operate over the three year review period, 
and provide the same level of service as it has been all along. And um, as I mentioned, it's intended that there will be two different court lists sitting alongside each other, which will allow for continued court business in addition to business within the office. Okay, thank, thank you. And uh, then uh, finally on this question, Patricia, do you want to add uh, preparedness? Uh, yes, yes, please, Patricia. As I say, we're a separate office to the wards of court, but it doesn't mean that we're not working with them and working with all the different um, bodies. But for my own office, like we have to prepare now. Um, but it's more than physical preparation. Any, any sister in my office or any case office can do the physical. Patricia, you'll understand the, the emotional and mental change is what's more important for my office. I became general sister in 2015. And I was very conscious that this act was coming in. So since then, I've had the authority, and the power to try and change the ethos of the general solicitor's office as to what is required. Now, I'm very restricted, obviously, by statute and by best interests. But the preparedness is that we are trying to bring in more cognizance of the will and preferences of our wards. And that's only added wards, obviously, minors are in a different uh, category. But with that, we have to look at clearly when they're discharged from ward trip there's going to be a dramatic change and we had to prepare every ward for that now the legal changes are we could be in the middle of a litigation case a probate case a conveyancing case and we have to look at when they're applying for discharge is it wise that they automatically discharge that day or should, is there more assistance my office can give to that ward to finish the probate or finish the conveyancing and, and reduce the cost of applying for new probate so that's the, the legal part and then informing, I know that the office, the wards of court are, is doing a communications bit, but as I say, I'm the same as every committee in the country. I have to make sure that my wards and their families or third party or next to kin know what's going to happen. And with that, there was always the confidentiality of wardship. But that's going to have to go now because we have to tell everybody what's involved, like what are the assets, what's the intention. The other preparation that I'm doing is the new cases have to be treated very differently from the cases that we have. We're looking at a case that if somebody comes into wardship, one coming in tomorrow, likely they're only going to be in my office for a year. So I can't be giving long term planning and proposals. It'll have to be short to medium term with a view that whatever proposal I'm giving to the court, the ward themselves under whatever system is going to have to make their own decisions as regards that. So there's an awful lot of, as I say, mental change in our attitude. And that has been happening for the last few years. And I'm, I'm really proud of that fact that we've taken on as much as we can the ethos of this act in, in our office. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm moving now on to the last question. And um, uh, really, this uh, is it will be very interesting to see again from the different sectors what are the challenges do you see for your sector upon the introduction of the legislation and how might these challenges be addressed? So again, I'm going to start with, with Gary on this occasion. Thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Patricia. Um, the, the great Professor Jerry Quinn often talks in terms of, of, of a paradigm uh, shift. Um, and I think we'll need that in the in the legal profession. The uh, the legal profession uh, really um, there needs to be a, a more general understanding that others may be involved where traditionally it was exclusively in, uh, just the client. And by facilitating the making of what the client might think themselves, uh, or what the solicitor might think themselves is an unwise decision, and not in the best interest of the client, that that does not bre breach their fiduciary relationship. That doesn't mean that they're not acting for the benefit of the client. In fact, it's quite the opposite. By enabling decision making, solicitor will actually ensure that the client's will and preference is met. And, and that has to be of, of paramount duty. The, the biggest challenge so would be migrating really from looking specifically at capacity and towards helping the relevant person to make the decision with perhaps the involvement of others. And I know some solicitors view this as a fundamental threat to the very nature of the solicitor client relationship. And it, but in speaking with colleagues that they, in the legal profession about the act, I would have some further concerns. So there needs to be a fuller realization that the act is not just limited to certain areas of law, such as wills, trust, probate, campaigns and healthcare and so on, but will actually permeate all areas of, of legal practice. So I think the challenge is, is 
to get those who don't practice uh, in other areas of law to understand that they, that, you know, that they'll need to be aware of, and, and in my view, trained um, in in assisted uh, decision uh, making. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're, you're right. I mean, this, the switch to a realization that this impacts um, all clients. So persons running businesses, large portfolios of assets, all of that. Uh, and they must be supported then uh, to make their decisions or to uh, be able to appoint somebody with legal authority uh, to assist in those areas. So hu huge issues there and obviously huge safeguarding issues too uh, around protecting people, uh, protecting people's assets, uh, protecting the person themselves, uh, all of those issues. And again, there's a lot of learning around all of that to be done to have the person the centre uh, of all of that decision making. So um, I'm going to move on. Alice, now, would you just talk again about the challenges you, that you see? Uh, there are obviously plenty coming from uh, an old wards of court system into a very different uh, system and the review of the wards uh, in relation to that. Yes, and I suppose um, one of the main challenges I've noted here and um, down here will be the learning exercise for staff within the court service around changing their expectations, around changing their assumptions based on what has gone in the past. But it's uh, apart from that, what the main challenge for my own office is going to be the review of 2,150 wards of court, the listing of those reviews in court over a three year period and the completion of those reviews and the discharge of wards within that three year period. And as I've mentioned previously, we've added additional medical visitors where we were taking on additional staff to ensure that we're going to be able to do that. And we're working with the judiciary around having additional court listings and planning for that. Um, Similarly, there are going to be resource implications for the circuit court in terms of additional staff, staff training, but also training for the judiciary in the circuit court who have, haven't got experience of working within this area. And that's been um, currently, I know the DSS are in talks with the Judicial Council around that particular issue. Staff in all offices, though, are going to require a level of learning and understanding around what's involved with dealing with a person where you are working on the assumption that they have capacity and um, how you are going to interact with them. The court service has taken on an initial for, first step in that in rolling out um, jam just a minute cards and just a minute card awareness um, training to all staff members and there's been a very high uptake of that and that's just one of the first steps in preparedness for um, the commencement of this legislation. Okay, thank, thank you uh, uh, Alice. So Patricia, over to you now. Thanks Patricia. Um, uh, curiously, I'm finding the biggest challenge at the moment for my office and I'm sure it's for a lot of people who are committees Trying to, I'm trying to open a bank account for every single ward that I have um, because previously the money would come into my office and I would either send it to the nursing home or send it to a family member working with them. And I'm encountering extraordinary difficulty with the banks. And I've had a number of residential units, say Daughters of Charity, different places. And, and Louise would know this as well from the National Advocacy. Every time I write to the bank and say, please open a bank account for this ward with my consent, with the consent of the court, I'm just meeting a wall now. I'm as a big, it's a challenge that I'm trying to get over, and I'm in negotiations with many of the banks, and I'm hoping to be able to do that. But that brings me on to the biggest challenge, I think, for everybody in relation to this. At the moment, if somebody is discharged from wardship and they haven't applied or an application has not been completed for the new system, the money is automatically released. Now I understand that that's been looked at and that other ideas are going to be put forward as to how to protect those funds in the meantime, because clearly if somebody requires the third stage, which is the rep, there are concerns in relation to the ability to 
handle, say, €4 million, Euro, that will just be handed over the minute the discharge. But I believe when, when we're looking at the, the last bit that that challenge is being looked at at the moment, and I'm delighted to hear that. And um, the other challenges I have is even for my own office, as I say, I have over 700 cases and we have over 300 already dismissals. The, the, the actual work involved in dismissing somebody in a live case is is massive. I know this from the cases I've already dealt with, and it's trying to time it that we do as much as we can up until the day of the discharge so that everything is prepared. And that means working with so many people, as I say, for example, the bank accounts. And then um, the other concern I have is staff and technology. Clearly, we're going to be extraordinarily busy, especially in the first year and then this year leading up to it. I'm glad to say the court service are going to provide more staff. And we recently were tendered for a new practice management evolved system, so our legal system. So we're, we're on the road with technology because clearly I'm not going to talk for me now. I'm going to talk for every committee in the country of the, the 3,000 or 2,000 wards. Um, they're going to have to find out all the information. If there's a litigation open, they'll have to change a, a certificate. They'll have to bring new proceedings. If there's a probate, they'll have to apply for new probate because anything that has been done in wardship, like say for a grant of probate, is not going to be valid anymore. So there's massive challenges in preparing for that. Yeah. Then the other challenge is while we're trying to review our files, we still have new cases coming in and we're still trying to deal with our current cases. So I'd say now you can probably see the grey hairs at this stage. <laughs> it is absolutely manic, but we're doing our best. And um, everybody, thankfully, is working well together to try and resolve it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, so it's apt then that uh, Bernice is after you from the Banking and Payments yeah. Federation. So Bernice, the challenges, and you hear some of them already. Yes. Going your way. So um if you could just uh, set out for, for the banking, the financial sector, really, what are the challenges that you see? Yeah, thank you, Patricia, um, and thanks to the other members of the panel. Yeah, I think it is hugely challenging, and I don't think that there would be answers to all of the um, problems and issues that arise, but I think it's really important that we're here. Please please get in touch. You know, um, BPFI has a very good working group, um, uh, which has been established for a number of years now. So I genuinely mean it when I say that we'd like to address issues. Um, so, so to Patricia's point there, please do write. And I'm not uh, promising a quick fix, but I really think we have to work together and identify the issues and try and resolve them and uh, uh, to, to support customers and to support uh, other stakeholders. I'll just start with that, Patricia. So the challenges, um, one of the biggest challenges is, and Anya alluded to this earlier, is the best interest uh, approach. This is really embedded in the way um, banks have done, uh, have conducted themselves because um, it is part of the central bank CPC, the Consumer Protection Code. So I think that, and I've listened to all of the other speakers in terms of the enormous education piece, the enormous shift in the way we think, this is huge for the financial services industry, uh, given the acts provisions and um, uh, uh, the heavily regulated status of this industry. Um, I, I think that the code for financial professionals, which we work closely on with other members of the writing group, will be helpful in this regard. And again, I don't think it will be an overnight uh, fix, but we will have to work um, as an industry and with members uh, to move forward as the act is primary legislation, we must adapt and we must uh, remember our learnings from the functional approach. I think it goes back to my initial point about the interagency approach and the parties engaging together. Um, a second point then I'll make is um, the ability to act on a concern to support a customer. And I always think about Mary Condell of Sages uh, bringing us through the tunnel um, I've, I've listened to her several times talking about bringing somebody through the tunnel and staying with them. And I think that's really pertinent. Um, 
Okay, for to, me, just when I cut off, when I cut off now. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so really, that's it, uh, Patricia. Yes. Those two, two challenges. There's many more, but perhaps I'll just record those for today. Thank you, Bernice. Uh, Thank just, you. I'm uh, very conscious that we want uh, people uh, present or attending to ask questions as well. So, Quiva, um, could you just uh, again briefly the challenges, which are many. Yes, what a challenging question. It's very hard to do this briefly, but I'll, I'll do my very best. Um, I think that uh, one of the key things is the message, managing the message and managing those messages quickly, um, because there's every danger. And we've already seen it that, you know, there's a message that uh, families don't matter, that this act is about undermining the role of families. That's not the, the function of the act. And I suppose part of our challenge and part of the DSS's challenge and everyone else's is to get messages out to staff and to families and to um, anybody else that's a circle of support about what the purpose of the act is. Um, and the message being keep the person at the centre. I think that's a huge piece of work that we have to keep doing over and over and over. Um, uh, the whole area of planning ahead um, it's not it's it's you know it's it's not part of our culture it's not and we saw it in covid um uh, that, that there's a huge piece of work for people to try and understand and trust what planning ahead means um one of the pieces in in an advanced healthcare directive is um uh, that you don't intervene that you know that you provide basic care that runs contrary to clinical practice which is about first do no harm and whereas your advanced healthcare director says don't do anything in some instances so you know even even to trust that is going to be a huge cultural shift in in certain services um uh, in terms of uh, um, i think as well that we need to keep the message simple for staff to be able to engage in it there are you know and i think um, um patricia and alice have outlined just how complicated this is um, at some level, but I suppose part of the role of our office is to uncomplicate it and to provide really clear guidance to staff about what they need to do and when. Um, and then I suppose going back to what I raised earlier on, there's a huge piece of work for us to do in terms of rethinking how risk is assessed and how, and then linked to that, how capacity is assessed. I think there's, there's a lot of work that we have yet to do. Um, we've started it and there's lots of conversations across, you know, we've over 100,000 people working in the HSE, um, you know, but I think there's, there's quite a bit of work to be done on how do we how do we now transition into this new way of thinking? Some areas have started to do it really well, but I think there's, we've a long road yet to go. Um, but we're, you know, I think we're on the way. There's, um, I suppose, as Bernice says, there's lots of other things, but I think for high level things, I think that's that's what I'd like to cover. OK, so Louise, then the challenges. Thanks, Patricia. I mean, a lot of this uh, is, is uh, we have common ground with a lot of the previous speakers in terms of the challenge. Sorry, Louise, you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry, okay. Cardinal Sin. Um, what I would say is um, that we have a lot of commonality with the previous speakers there in terms of the challenges. I might just address some, a couple of particular things. So in terms of advocacy in particular, um, the lack, um, I suppose, of additional resources going into advocacy um, will be a challenge if, you know, everything that comes to pass has been set out by my colleagues here com comes to pass, that our capacity to respond to that will be quite limited. And um, we're already a service um, under severe, severe pressure resource wise. I think in addition to that, the absence of kind of the regulation or legislation pertaining to advocacy will also be a challenge for us in terms of supporting both people who wish to avail of the provisions of the Act, family and friends and other professions around understanding what the role of advocacy is. Wider than that, I suppose the challenges that I would see would be really, I think the cultural shift is the biggest one. Um, it's almost like every single person really has to start thinking differently about decision making and about capacity. And there is a bit of a kind of intellectualization of the process that all of us need to go through. And that's going to be really difficult for um, stressed families who are maybe looking after providing support to someone with a severe disability. And um, for harried professionals, we've seen the duress they've been under throughout COVID. That's going to be a real challenge for people to adjust their own thinking processes around it. And I do think that's going to be an absolutely massive challenge. 
I think what's also really important is that we don't lose sight of the challenges for people who communicate differently, that we all have to think about how just because someone doesn't use speech or the written word, um, that may use um, ISL or other forms of sign or who may use um, a, a behaviours or gestures to communicate, that we all have to start thinking differently about that, that it might take longer to do the communication, but clearly something is being communicated there. And then I think also as well, for me, the biggest piece really is that access to information. Like the experience you described there, Patricia, around the banking and Bernice, this isn't have a pop at the bankers, which I know often comes to pass, but it is a massive challenge. Um, access to the financial institutions already is really problematic. And as you said, Patricia, the challenges over the next sort of 24 to 36 months around that are huge. And we would definitely welcome an engagement with um, yourselves, Bernice, around that. Um, and as I say, we do come across really every aspect engagement with legal professionals, engagement with the banks, um, engagement with health and social care, and we've seen it through COVID, the decision making, even in the acute settings, has been really problematic as well, and around um, the vaccine uptake has also been problematic. So um, I don't want to be so negative around it, just to say that we are really excited about the commencement of the Act, we've been long awaiting it, um, but I do think it's going to be really complicated. But I think most of it is around our own thinking and as Patricia said that pulling together collaboration across all every sector is just going to be so important so the messaging has to come at the highest possible level from the state the campaigning around COVID has to be replicated to some extent around this legislation because it's so impactful for the entire um entire society so not, not much to do uh, uh, thank you very much, Louise. So uh, just again to stress, even from a safeguarding perspective, the whole question of interagency collaboration cannot emphasise that enough in terms of us all working together. Comes back to questioners, a, a point that Patricia Hickey made in relation to uh, treating wards information confidentially and now having to uh, state the, you know, their assets and things like that. But the truth of the matter is, we haven't again uh, developed our data sharing legislation, which we're allowed to do, uh, where there are safeguarding issues and to share it appropriately and necessary. But we need to work out mechanisms to work on an interagency basis about all of that. So I'm going to ask uh, a number of questions here. I'm going to bring Anya back in for some of them, but one I'm going to ask each of you before uh, just um, asking general questions. Um, We've been through the challenges, and I'm going to ask you just in one or two sentences, what are your sector's biggest fears about the legislation? So that's a question that's come in. So I'm going to start with you, Alice, um, first on that. So what are your biggest fears about the legislation? Um, well, I suppose this is something that I actually had a discussion with Anya Flynn about recently, and it's where a person is discharged from wardship but has yet to come um, under the decision support service. And until they're under the supervision of the decision support service, if their funds are returned to them from court and there, there's a gap then for a few months, um, what, what could potentially happen in that period? And that is something that myself and Anya have had a discussion about, and it's something that we're going to work on coming up with a solution on. Okay, so, so next, Patricia, what are your fears? My fears are very strong because like Patricia and all, you know, I've been in doing this sector since 2004 and I've seen many changes. But there's a lot of my cases, the reason why the general sister is appointed is because there's been either physical, emotional, financial, sexual abuse off the ward and, and has come into, into the wardship in a desperate state. And we all know of certain cases that have been in the papers. And that's the ones where they were so neglected and there was no voice for them. And I suppose my concern is I'm delighted this act is coming in. I am delighted for the majority of persons under wardship. It will be fantastic. It will be a great human rights, their voice being heard for that very small sector where there's an extreme safeguarding issue. And my biggest concern is who is going to be their representative um, 
it can happen that we can all be blinded by the flowery person that comes in and says, yes, I'm wonderful. And then you scratch the surface and you see they have not been wonderful. And I suppose that was the one advantage of wardship is that you had my role, which was independent. And I could get in and I could scratch and scratch and find out what was going on. And it's going to be very difficult even for the pair reps because it looks like there are going to be solicitors in private practice and they're not going to be fully dedicated like my office or Alice's office is. So that's a big concern I have. But what hard was it bad law or hard cases make bad law? So that's a small section for the majority of the wards, even when I'm appointed, it will be wonderful. They'll have so much more freedoms, rights, dignity and, and, and their voice. Um, so okay. that, that's my view. Thank you. Uh, just to say to you, you're actually pointing out the lack of the big gap of adult safeguarding legislation, which is another issue, not only for people who are wards, but also people out in the community who are extremely, extremely at risk and need support and help. But however, Bernice, I'm going to ask you again, if you can be as brief as you can, uh, the biggest fears about the legislation. I, I suppose fear might be a little bit um, of, of an exaggeration, but certainly the biggest concern is how the legislation will sit in the regulated environment within which the financial service uh, sector operates. So it's really that harmony with the uh, central bank regulation um, and the points I kind of mentioned earlier. So whilst customers are key, um, of course, uh, financial services providers are businesses, so they don't want to put themselves in a position where there will be an enforcement action. So it's to marry uh, those two things, if you like, and make sure that there's harmony, if that makes sense, Patricia. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Quiva, your fears? Um, uh, that it'll remain with the coalition of the willing, which is us. Um, and I've often talked to Anya about this, that, that the message won't get out there. Um, that um, I know we've talked a lot about wards, but it's it's much more than wardship that you know thousands of other people that need the protections of the act, and that that it it it'll become so complicated that it'll be too difficult for people to ex to access it, and it won't be used. I suppose that that's our greatest concern that 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 it 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 doesn't reach those that really need it. So I think going back to what um, Louise said, there needs to be investment in the messaging so it becomes that everybody knows about this and it becomes something that everyone can talk about and, and then, you know, figure out, oh, that's something I need to think about in all of its very various facets, because it, it's not one thing. It's an, it's multi, a multiplicity of things. Yeah. So Louise, over to you. Thank you, Kiva. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think like that, the, the biggest concern that I would have would be that um, the people who really need access to the legislation aren't able to access it because they don't know about it and they're not supported to find out about it. Um, and thinking of people living in residential services, um, either for disabilities or mental health or maybe people in homeless, homelessness services, all of whom um, could avail of the provisions of the Act, but just because they're a bit disconnected um, from kind of mainstream society and mainstream media etc are not able to access the provisions of it. My other main concern is an estrangement from kind of family circles as well. I think you know anytime there's a kind of public discourse around the legislation um, you can see you know reaction from family members understandably very concerned about what it means for their role often having carried you know quite serious caring and decision making responsibilities um, for many years and how that will impact them and I think it's really important that we don't make those people feel they are being disempowered in terms of their role or that um, they are being critiqued um, for the work that you know because it is unpaid work that they have done for many years and that we actually value that and that we really uh, you know it doesn't just become ourselves talking to each other that we actually have an all-encompassing approach I think that's the only way that that can be avoided and bringing people on that a journey to use that kind of cheesy expression that would be my um way of proposing we resolve that as well as the communications piece thank, thank you please. gary um, well there needs to be that uh, shift in thinking in the legal profession um there is a perceived um fear that it is going to fundamentally interfere with the solicitor client um relationship um and there's also concerns 
around empowering um, people uh, who might be considered obviously vulnerable as vulnerable people, empowering people to make maybe unwise decisions, whereas those decisions might well be their their will and preference. And I think I think they're the they're the two major concerns um, that 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 the the, the profession uh, would have. Okay. Thank you, Gary. So I'm going to um, put one or two questions now to Anya. Anya, you're, you're still there? Yes, I am. Great, great. And uh, just to say to members of the panel, you're still not off the hook because there's questions, quite a lot of questions coming in. So uh, Anya, just very practical question first. Um, could you update uh, us all on the codes of practice and the public consultation with regard to the codes? And then just when you deal with that, uh, a question, what will happen if people don't respect the legislation? Um, yeah, um, to turn to the codes first, thanks very much, Patricia. And thanks very much, by the way, for that very interesting discussion. I find it quite soothing to sit and listen to the coalition of the willing, I have to say. Um, and it certainly fills me with, with hope rather than fear. Um, to see that people are so committed and well informed. Codes of practice, yeah. Um, and um, thanks very much to the NDA and to Quiva's group who have been responsible for the drafting of the codes. Um, there were 15 in total and they have been with us for review for some time. Uh, the plan is to embark on the consultation on the codes in the coming months before year end. Um, the plan is to go out with them in two tranches. Um, commencing, first of all, with the bigger, if you like, overarching code um, for supported decision making and assessment of capacity and the code for health and social care professionals. And um, at this stage, plans aren't fully finalised, but to include also the codes for the professions for legal practitioners and financial services providers. So do please look out for those. I think the second question, Patricia, if I've answered the first one then, was in relation to what can happen. Sorry, do you want to just ask me again what can happen to uh, a person who breaches the Act, I think it was? Who doesn't comply with the Act, interveners that don't uh, abide by the guiding principles. Uh, sure. um, okay, intervener has a particular definition under the Act. I think that was one of the other questions as well. So it is defined in Section 2. Um, uh, an intervener is somebody in a category, I think it's A to E, so uh, the director is always an intervener, the courts are interveners, any of the uh, categories of supporters fall into the definition of intervener, as does a healthcare professional, and you're an intervener when you're carrying out an intervention under the Act, which is an Act, if you make an order or direction or so on, then you're, you're captured by those, those guiding principles. Um, and then if you were to breach those, well, as I've said, we um, can take complaints. So we have a role in respect of the regulation of the decision of the border. Um, we will hear complaints. We can commence on initiative investigations. We can escalate to court um, if we find a complaint well founded, and then the court could uh, remove somebody from their post as a decision supporter. Ideally, you know, very much as a last resort, as I've said, we plan to help people to be the best supporters that they can be. Um, we don't, as I've said, have a regulatory role in respect of other professionals. So if you think for a moment about um, the, the healthcare professional, um, as Gary has pointed out, lawyers and financial services providers fall outside that strict definition of intervener. However, um, yeah, the, the codes of practice can be of relevance there so that the, a breach of the code of practice can be introduced in, um, in other related proceedings. Um, you know, if we can sort of stage an intervention, we can try and say to a particular legal practitioner, look, this is a real co-decision making agreement, or these are the principles of the act. This is um, how this is all meant to work. Uh, in the hope that you know we would encourage cooperation, they really aren't cooperating. I suppose we could think about what to do after that. But um, yeah, that, that I hope explains um, how our our complaints and investigations process is structured. Okay, thank you for that, Anya. Uh, Quiva, just again another practical question um, in relation to the e-learning modules, uh, the HSE e-learning mo modules. Will they be available for public or just for HSE staff? So they, they are just for um, HSE and HSE funded agencies because it's on a platform that's for staff in particular. Um, but mm -hmm. if that person wants to contact us to talk about the content of it, 
let them um they can make contact with me directly um i'll i'll put my my email address in the chat so people can have access to that yeah Trisha, i might mention we'll also have of ours and um, quivas are, are really excellent and i would recommend them to anybody who's able to access them and um, but we're developing our own e-learning and other guidance tools as well which obviously have to be for more general consumption sure. and they'll be available via the website there's information there already great okay um, and I have a, a, another number of questions for you, Anya, but I'll answer this one here directly. Does the individual have to now change their current power of attorney uh, with the introduction of the legislation? And the answer is no. If, you, if a person has made their enjoying power of attorney, uh, that will be fully recognised under the new legislation. If they have capacity still after the commencement of the act, if they want to change it or vary it, or do a new uh, enjoying power of attorney on the 2015 Act, they can do so. Uh, but if they don't do anything, even if it's not registered yet, still come into effect uh, under the new legislation. So Anya, back to you again. Is there manda mandatory training required to become a support person? And are designated supporters remunerated uh, by the state? So this, and uh, I suppose there's the the panel of the designated decision making representatives and those who are, don't come off the panel so maybe just first is there mandatory training uh, required to become a, a support person and then the other uh, uh, the remuneration issue um, we will make training available to our panel members who are that um, subcategory of decision making representatives who would be available to be appointed by the court there isn't mandatory training uh, for anybody who may find themselves in the role of decision making assistant co-decision maker um, a dmr other than a panel member designated healthcare representative or attorney um, but guidance will be available information will be available we are available as a resource if people have particular queries i think it would be onerous to say that before um a family member, a friend, a person that pre-existing relationship of trust could step into a role that they had to undergo training. Uh, that's not the, the vision of the Act, but absolutely assistance, guidance, support, all of that will be available. Uh, I think the second question was then about remuneration. Uh, there is provision for um, expenses at the level of co-decision making uh, and decision making representative um attorneys also but the act specifically provides for decision making representatives if they are um carrying out their own in connection with the profession or trade to be remunerated as directed by the court remembering that that decision making representative takes their authority from the court order and the court would have to so provide they could be remunerated from the assets of the person where that can be achieved um we have put together a document to try and create parameters around that. Uh, I think there uh, it will be important that there is um, some obvious oversight of what people are able to remunerate themselves and the Act provides to that for an extent. And where there aren't assets in the estate, and you won't see this in the Act at the moment, but we're hoping it will be the subject of an amendment, um, where there aren't assets in the estate, that that person acting as a DMR in the course of a trade or profession um, can uh, be paid on a on a scheme of fees akin to legal aid administered by ourselves uh, and the details of that are to be worked out. Okay, thanks, Anya. And a, a, a somewhat related question then is uh, co-decision makers and decision making reps uh, have it easier as they have structures and guidance. What guidance is there for more informal support, such as a decision making assistant? There will be guidance as well, and there will be a code of practice for a decision making assistant. Um, and I hope that all of the information about the Act generally will also um, be of, of help to a decision making assistant. I think it's purposely uh, less direct of the ideas that that's the least interventionist um, uh, tier of support uh, with least formality and regulation around it. Um, but information will be there and a particular uh, code directed at the DMA. Yeah, and related to that, and I'm going to put it to uh, Louise, has consideration been given to the development of citizen advocacy service to support people who may not have family or other support person? 
Um, I think in relation to advocacy, I think it goes back to my earlier point about the, um, the fact that the, the Act itself is largely silent on the provision of advocacy. From our own perspective, um, what we will be doing in the, the run up to the commencement of the legislation is again reviewing our own processes around who can access our service and what that might look like. I suppose the fundamental role of an advocate is to support the individual to have their voice heard. It's not necessarily to provide support to family members to fulfil potential other obligations under the legislation. However, I think given that there might be a few gaps there, for particularly in this kind of transitional phase over the next few years, that we might have to have a look at that and see what can be provided. Um, for family members. What I would emphasize to any family member or, or, or anyone else listening today is that the advocacy service is there to provide information and um, advice around the act as well. So if there is a family member who wants to know, you know what um, is available to them, that they look at the resources that the DSS have provided, but we can also provide further information that, you know, to help people with their own decision making around that. It doesn't mean to say that we will provide a full advocacy service, if you like, but we can certainly give independent information and advice around it. I'm not quite sure that's exactly answering the question, but I think that's how I'm interpreting it for the moment. Yeah. Th thank you for that, Louise. And I suppose, again, uh, just to come back to the support for people who are generally uh, decision supporters or decision decision making assistants, uh, various different professional organisations will obviously assist person who are working with people or service users in relation to all of that very important so um we've spoken about codes as well and i'm very conscious uh, the whole issue of finance and while bernice has mentioned the financial codes again drafted uh, with the through the, the the national disability authority just bernice if i could put you on the spot uh, in relation to the central bank's code consumer code in relation to what they had termed in the 2012 uh, consumer code as vulnerable persons and we've mm -hmm. um, uh, heard talk in the last year or so about developing further uh, the code uh, in relation obviously in the context of the act uh, is there any further update on that or do we know where we're at at all yes um well as you know the um, cpc is generally um going to be reviewed and there'll be a consultation on that that consultation hasn't been commenced yet now i had a recent conversation about our point about uh, best interests and the act and i have to be honest and say that i have to pursue it because i think i need to explain in more detail where we're coming from if you like um, so um, I am going to raise that point specifically. What I mean by that is how the best interests will work vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the code. Uh, the person I was speaking to didn't see necessarily that there was a problem. And we may need to just live with that and work around it, but we need to highlight it and make sure that uh, we can operate and that there isn't a conflict. So, um, Patricia, the code is up for review. There'll be a public consultation, but we're certainly engaging on a bilateral basis in any event in the meantime. Great. Thank you for that, Bernice. The other point that I think uh, we should just mention is the question of legal aid. And we have seen certainly in the past uh, that while the Civil Legal Aid or, um, Act does not debar uh, legal aid to people, uh, there's no resources to provide it. And that's a big issue. And it certainly was an issue that came out in the AC versus Cork University Hospital case. Um, but uh, and the Act does provide for uh, legal aid for people who are making an application to court under Part 5. And Anya, my understanding is that the amending Act will also provide and ensure that people who are uh, whose uh, capacity has been reviewed coming from wardship, they will also be provided with legal aid. But of course, there are many other people that may require legal aid under the Act for various applications. And again, to put you on the spot, uh, and uh, I've had conversations with uh, the department and that on that, but in terms of the whole access to justice, say a person making an enjoying power of attorney where they need the assistance of a solicitor to make an enjoying power of attorney, there's currently no provision and uh, there's no proposal that I know of uh, for legal aid to help such a person. So in terms of legal aid, um, are there further developments there that we need to highlight and uh, really advocate for? 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, you're, you're correct about the um, anticipated amendments in respect to part six, uh, so that the, the ward exiting wardship will have the same access to representation as uh, is provided for the relevant person coming newly into the system under the new framework under part five. I think you're also correct, though, to say, Patricia, that the Act doesn't spell out supports for those other forms of support for advice to be av available in relation to um, enduring powers of attorney and so on. Uh, and that's certainly something that I think people may want to, to um, highlight and, and bring to the attention of the those who can make that available. Um, the Legal Aid Board is now represented on the interdepartmental steering groups. There's a representative from Justice who speaks for the Legal Aid Board. Um, but yep, um, we, can, we can pursue that point. Uh, it is important in the broadest sense that people consider advanced planning uh, that costs shouldn't be a barrier. Um, it is anticipated as well that there will be um, an adjustment to the provisions around EPAs and how they're to be set up um, to streamline that process, to make it more accessible, um, perhaps to give the lawyer less to do and less exposure, which might in turn impact on what a solicitor uh, would charge uh, for an enduring power of attorney. So, um, Although the Act does still say that a statement is required from a solicitor that the person understands uh, the EPA. So I, that, that may be of benefit and arguably if, if we all had EPAs, then uh, the market might drive down fees. Yeah. Thank you for that, Anya. And I'm going to, I, I realise it's just one o'clock. So I want to really sincerely thank the members of the panel, um, Alice White, Patricia Hickey, Bernice Evoy, Priva Gleeson, Louise Laughlin and Gary Lee for a very informative insight into your own organisations and your responses and your fears, concerns and all of that. Very informative for everybody. So thank you very much indeed. So I'll hand back to uh, Aideen now. Thank you very much, Patricia, for so ably chairing uh, such a large panel uh, and with so many complex issues under discussion and really it is only for me to hand you into your lunch break uh, at this stage and we will reconvene at uh, 10 to 2 13 50 for the next part of the day thank you very much everybody